Hi, I'm David Taub, and welcome to the Parsha Rabbit Hole, where I find something weird in the weekly Torah portion and follow it all the way down until it gets even weirder. This week's rabbit hole eventually gets to the definition of wicked and a story about an old-timey sea captain. Captain Carl, did you remember to wash your hands? No! <laughs> but, as always, we have to get there. This week's episode is dedicated in honor of the shoes that I did not buy for my children. If you'd like to sponsor an episode of the Parsha Rabbit Hole, go to creativejudaism.com slash donate. Okay, let's get started. This week's Torah portion, Parsha Tzav, is all about sacrifices again. And one of those sacrifices is the Korban Toida, or the Thanks Offering, which is brought by a person who survives a life-threatening experience. And although we're no longer able to offer that sacrifice today because ancient anti-Semites destroyed our temple, there is a counterpart to that sacrifice, a blessing called Birkas HaGoymel, which we are able to say today. So the first thing we're going to start with is the Gemara that lists the types of experiences that would require a person to offer the Korban Toida or to say HaGoymel. This is what it says. Four people must offer thanks. Seafarers, those who travel in the desert, one who was sick and got better, and one who was imprisoned and then released. I think we should all be grateful to him. So there's a lot of technical halakhic discussion about how broad of a category each one of these things represents and exactly what type of situations require a person to say this bracha. But this is the partial rabbit hole, and that's not really what we do here. What we do here is we look for the weird and follow it. And that specific list of life-threatening situations, seafarers, desert travelers, sick people, and imprisoned people, seem like an interesting place to start digging. So, if you're ready to see where that leads, let's dive in. Okay, first of all, that list is derived from verses in Kapitel Kuf Zion of Tehillim, or Psalms 107. But when the Gemara lists those four types of experiences, it does it in a different order than they appear in the verses of Tehillim. So that's a question that a lot of commentaries deal with, including the Ben Ishchai, who answers it in a way that I thought was particularly interesting. He says that the first two, the sea and the desert travelers, are both situations where a person would be more likely to be grateful afterwards. Both of those cases usually only happen because a person deliberately chose to take that risk, because they wanted something on the other side. For example, a business trip. I'll need three ships and fifty stout men. We'll sail round the horn and return with spices and silk, the likes of which ye have never seen. We're building a casino. Arr. But the sick person and the person who was in prison, even after they come out of it okay, they might feel kind of bitter about it and feel like, hey, why should I make a bracha thanking Hashem for this? I'd rather not have to have gone through this at all and not have to make the bracha at all. So therefore, he says, the travelers are mentioned first because it's more natural to want to give thanks, and then the other two are listed afterwards because it's less obvious. So the reason why I like this is because I do feel like that sometimes. Thank God not for anything real, but for silly petty stuff. So it was fun for me to see my pettiness acknowledged as human nature, and then be told that I still have to be grateful. Okay, so we'll dig deeper into those four types of experiences a little bit later. But, when I started digging around for Birkas Goimo, I came across something else from the Beni Shchai, a tshuva, or responsum, in which he offers a parable to someone who asked him some questions, and Hagoimel is mentioned very tangentially there, but the letter was so fun, and I couldn't not include it. So someone asked him some questions about Kabbalah, and he says he's unable to answer those questions because he's not an expert in the subject, which, by the way, I think most people would disagree with that assessment. But, he says, in lieu of answering the guy's questions, he'll fill this letter with open rebuke. He goes on and mentions that the guy, in his original letter to him, very proudly informed him that he had learned a certain Kabbalistic text five times, and he wanted to know if now he should start gathering students and teaching them this text. And the Ben Ishchai is very harsh about that. And then he offers this parable. It's very long, so I'm not going to put it on screen, but I'll tell it to you a little bit condensed in my own words. There was once a man who lived in the islands of Portugal, and he was the captain of the king's entire naval fleet. He had a wife and a young son who lived in France, and he hardly saw them, and so he asked the king one day when he got old and he hadn't seen his wife and son for a long time if he could go visit them. So when he was there, he told his wife that when he retires, he wants his son to take over for him. In order to do that, he has to take their son back with him and train him for many years. 
So then the wife weeps and cries and says that she can't bear to have her son taken away from her, but that she also wants her son to take over as the captain. And so she asks her husband if maybe he could train the boy while he was still there without taking him away from her. And the captain agreed. So he got a bowl full of water and he put the young boy on his lap and he said, See, my son, this is the great sea. And then he floated an eggshell in the water and got a needle and stuck it in the middle of the eggshell and said, See, my dear son, this is the ship and then this is the mast. And then he got three smaller needles and stuck those in the eggshell and said that those are the other masts, but that the big one is the main mast. And then he peeled off the membrane of the eggshell and tore it into 12 pieces and attached it to the needles and said, these are the sails that catch the wind and make the ship move. And then he took some hairs and attached them to the needles and to the egg membrane and said, these are the ropes that the sailors use to control the sails. Then he took two hairs and twisted them together into like a thick hair rope and said, this is the anchor cable that the ship is tied to at port. And this rope is to sailors what Birkas HaGoymel is to the Jews. I just want to note before I continue that this is the only mention of HaGoymel in this whole story, and that's my entire excuse for including it. Also, I'd like to mention that in the original Hebrew, this whole story rhymes, so I'm not doing that justice at all, but I still think it's worth it to hear the story. Okay, let's continue. So then he takes a piece of wax and he molds it into an anchor and attaches it to the anchor cable hairs. And then he takes some more wax and sculpts little rooms and puts them on the eggshell ship. And then he makes one room and puts it at the front of the ship. And he says, this is the captain's quarters where you'll live. And then he dropped a spoon in the water and the water splashed the egg ship around and the center needle fell out. And the captain said, a storm has come and the main mast has broken. So now you have to repair it with spare parts that you keep on the ship. Then he took the spoon out of the water and the water calmed down and he said, now the storm has passed, my son, and the sailors have gone to sleep. And he hugged and kissed his son goodnight and handed him back to his wife. And then he told her, be happy, my noble wife, your son is now wise and is ready to be called captain. Okay, so the thing that I love about this story is that it's an incredibly detailed and elaborate way to just tell a guy that his level of learning Kabbalah is like a toddler playing boats with eggshells. So that's fun. The other thing that I thought was interesting about this is that the Ben Ishchai is specifically using the sea as a metaphor for Kabbalistic teachings here. But Torah in general is often compared to water, and the Talmud specifically is compared to the sea in one place. But I had never thought about the possibility of drowning in Torah before. So this whole metaphor made me think about that. I tried digging around to find sources that explored that idea of the possible risks of traveling in the Sea of Torah, but I didn't really find much. If any of you have seen something like that, please share it in the comments. One more thing about the story that was interesting is that I had some trouble translating some of the boat terminology, so I gave it to an AI to translate. And even though I didn't ask for it, the AI also gave me its thoughts on the story. And apparently current AI technology isn't very good at picking up on subtle cynicism, because it said that the captain successfully taught his son how to be a ship's captain, and that the story ends with a message of hope and optimism. In case you can't tell, I'm being sarcastic. So, the AI didn't get it. Okay, back to Agoimel. After I was done looking at the commentaries on that Gemara that gave us the list of those four types of experiences, and after I got back from my little side excursion to the islands of Portugal, I searched for this phrase, Arba Tzrichim Lehoidois, four people need to offer thanks, to see if I could find anything interesting about these four experiences in particular, and why these are the archetypes that the Torah gives us. And I found a Rashima from the Lubavitcher Rebbe that kind of maps out these four things and presents them as creating a kind of geographical map of life threatening situations. He says that these four things represent various divisions between human beings and their environment, and divisions within the environment itself. The sick person is when the threat is coming from within the person themselves. Prison is when the threat is external, from society, the people around them. Then we zoom out even more, and the threat becomes the earth itself, without any people. That's the desert. And then, zooming out even further, beyond dry land, the threat is the ocean. There's no water in the desert. What was I thinking? <laughs> ocean! 
the Rebbe there actually offers several different ways to approach these four things. And the one that I just shared with you is the first one, and they get increasingly deeper and more mystical from there. But this one, the simplest one, was kind of the most interesting to me because it takes these four different things, which seemingly are unconnected, other than the fact that they're all life-threatening, and it sets them all up on one continuum, and that was neat to me. Okay, so after I looked around for stuff about these four categories, I decided to look at the bracha itself. The language of the blessing is Baruch HaTah Hashem Eleikeinu Melech HaElam HaGoymu LeChayavim Toivais Shigamalani Toiv Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who bestows goodness upon the culpable for having bestowed goodness to me. The language there is interesting. HaGoymu LeChayavim Who bestows upon the Chayavim which means the culpable or guilty or obligated. But whatever it means, it seems to suggest that this terrible experience that somebody just went through was somehow deserved. Why me, Lord? Where have I gone wrong? I've always been nice to people. I don't drink or dance or swear. I've even kept kosher just to be on the safe side. Which is something that kind of rubs me the wrong way and is definitely worth exploring. The Beis Yosef explains this wording in a way that I thought was interesting. He says that this blessing is thanking Hashem for bestowing goodness even on people who are chayev, which I won't even bother translating because he does. He says this means rashayim, which is usually translated as wicked people. A Russia is a wicked person. And he adds that the translation of the word Russia is Chayova. And then he concludes that the intent of the person making this blessing is that I too am one of these Rashaim, these bad people. And even though I don't deserve God's goodness, it has nonetheless been bestowed upon me. Okay, so you might be wondering why I shared this. At first glance, it seems pretty fire and brimstone, which is not what I'm usually into. But there's something interesting going on there that caught my attention. The reason that whole explanation might feel harsh or negative is because in English we translate Russia as a wicked person or an evil person. But the Beis tells us right there that the translation of Russia is Chayava, which means culpable or obligated, which I think takes all the moral judgment out of it. And to me, that's a very Jewish and very different way of looking at that word than what I think we're used to. I actually think that it's probably really difficult for most people to think about that word Russia without any moral judgment, and just think of it as someone who, like all of us, has to deal with the consequences of their actions. Now, whether the consequences of my mistakes weren't being lost at sea is something I'd probably argue against, but I'm still looking around for sources to back that up. All right, that's it. That's the rabbit hole. As always, questions, things I missed, put them in the comments. Thank you for following me down the rabbit hole. I hope it didn't feel life-threatening.